guys, we're really excited about our guest lecturer tonight. Uh, his name is Jonah Sachs. Um, he is the founder of Free Range Studios. Uh, they are, for those of you who don't know, a social advocacy and branding firm. Uh, they have a quote on their website I thought was great. It says, great stories make great change possible. Um, they've been named by Fast Company as one of the top social innovators for 2010. Um, Jonah is the author of a book called Winning the Story Wars. Um, also known for some very uh, uh, famous videos that have gone viral. Um, like these ones we're showing you. Like the ones you're seeing on the screen there. Matrix and of course the story of stuff, which is the first time I was introduced to uh, uh, some of their work. Um, uh, some of the latest things they've been up to, uh, actually Harvard Business Review in 2012, published uh, Jonah's Manifesto for Values Driven Storytelling in media marketing called Story Wars. And uh, we've, we've actually, you know, we've talked a lot about in the program here about how do we use stories to bring about change. And uh, we wanted to show you the latest video work. Uh, we, we all reviewed it, thought it was pretty, pretty helpful to the class. So. Yeah. For weeks he had been living off of hand-rolled cigarettes and ancient Sanskrit poetry. Starved, parched, six feet tall and 116 pounds, there was almost nothing left. A wasted man in a wasteland. He kept his back turned to the hastily constructed city. A jeep rolled by ahead of the test site, and he waited for another flash of lightning. When it came, he could briefly make out the vast desert nothingness. Like a nuclear bomb was dropped here, he thought. The phrase would soon become a horrifying cliché. But these words passed through Oppenheimer's mind first. That day, only he and a handful of other exhausted men knew the bomb existed. In spare moments like these, Oppenheimer had been reading the Bhagavad Gita, a 4,000-year-old sacred text. It was science that he used to create the bomb, but it was a myth he used to understand what it all meant. At times he saw himself as Arjuna, the reluctant hero forced into battle with his cousins. Arjuna appeals to Lord Krishna for help and must choose either Krishna's vast armies or his bottomless wisdom. He chooses the power of the God's mind. Arjuna's story fit Oppenheimer's own. That the wisdom of a few men could overcome the armaments of even millions was what he had been hired to prove. At other times, though, he thought of himself as Krishna. Until now, it had only been the gods who held the power to utterly destroy worlds. That power might soon become his own. Now, the announcer shouted, and the men braced themselves. There was a flash, and the pre-dawn became day, the brightest and hottest any of them had ever known. There was jubilation, but as the men celebrated, Oppenheimer's mind returned to the Gita. He would often recall his thought of that moment. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. His words were the words of Krishna. But all he said aloud was, it worked. Soon, two bustling Japanese cities would be as wasted as the New Mexico desert. For many, these blasts would bring their most important stories into serious question. The Old Testament casts man as small, subject to the whims of God and nature. These myths were just not equipped to handle the bomb that Oppenheimer had created. That day marked another major lurch in the widening of our myth gap, the space between the realities of our moment and the shared stories to which we turn for guidance. Humans need shared myths. Every society we know of was built on these all-important stories. But where do we find them in rapidly changing times? To identify a working myth, we need to look for four key elements. Explanation, meaning, story, and ritual. And for a myth to work, it must be understood and shared by everyone. Today our myths come from marketers. Beginning in the 50s, marketers perfected the use of stories to move minds, and they revolutionized society. Take the Marlboro Man. Explanation? Here's a filtered cigarette, a better way to smoke. Meaning? Get the identity of a rugged cowboy. Story. We care about him, though we know he's not real. And ritual? You can live this story every time you light up. Nearly every successful marketing campaign has created new myths, and a world hungry for just that has gobbled them up. The most successful marketers have become myth makers, 
but too many have abused that power. Where the great stories of the past told of a hero's journey towards higher purpose, most marketers have pushed fear, insecurity, and greed. This is the dark art of marketing, and we have all suffered under its rule. But there is a new hope, a way to fight back in the story wars. Empowerment marketing myths call people to citizenship, to live their values, and to fight the lies in the dark art. A few of the most iconic brands have discovered this powerful story wars weapon, and it has begun to reshape our world. They are breaking through the media noise and telling the truth about human nature as great myths have done for millennia. Learn to tell and live these truths, and you too will get heard and help to create a better world. This is your call to adventure, the call to enter and win the story wars. We humans have always been obsessed with communicating. It's how we turn ideas into the glue that binds us together, into tribes and societies. In oral traditions, an idea spreads from person to person. Everyone briefly owns it, modifies it, and can choose to pass it through social networks or let it die. It's survival of the fittest, and only the most compelling ideas thrive. But the last hundred years of the broadcast era changed all that. Here, audiences became consumers of ideas, not participants in spreading them. Brands and causes with access to broadcasts could guarantee attention. It became survival of the richest. Now that the broadcast era is ending, what will come next? With audiences again in charge of what ideas they seek, skip, and pass along, we are entering a time that looks like a digitally empowered version of the oral tradition. The digitoral era. Here it's survival of the fittest again. And what kind of ideas survive in any oral tradition? Stories. It's time we all became storytellers again. But how? It starts by thinking of your brand itself as a story. Every communication you create is another chapter in an unfolding epic starring you and your audience. On the surface of any story, you'll find characters, settings, conflict. None of these things are placed there by chance. Every visible element of a well-told story is there to illustrate a core truth about the world, a moral of the story. Morals are themselves expressions of values that the storyteller wants to share. Different values create vastly different morals and story surfaces. Joseph Campbell, who studied stories across cultures and millennia, discovered the most universally successful stories, or myths, call audiences to higher human values, like community, justice, truth, and self-expression. Campbell also uncovered the hero's journey, a formula for iconic storytelling that has always worked. We still see it everywhere, and it provides huge insights for a story-based brand. An unlikely hero, a powerless outsider, muddles through a broken world. She wants to live out her higher values, but feels powerless to do so. Then she meets a mentor who tells her so much more is possible. He gives her a magic gift and calls her to a dangerous adventure of self-discovery. On this adventure, she confronts the evil source of the world's brokenness and seizes a treasure with which she comes back to heal society. Audiences thrill to hear this story again and again. Brands can use this formula to become storytelling masters too. How? Start with the hero. This hero doesn't start out as the insider, the one with the power. He's an outsider to your brand. So, she's not you. The hero of your story is your audience. So if you're not the hero, who are you? The mentor. You are the character that reveals more is possible. You work to connect audiences to their deeper values. You teach a core truth, a moral of the story, that provides hope to heal a broken world. Stop talking about how great you are and start telling stories about how great your audience can be. And give them a magic gift, something that makes the adventure you are offering seem likely to succeed. A great brand gift has taken good story brands and made them cultural icons. Any brand can become a story brand by finding its relevance in its values, its consistency by building every communication around its moral. It finds resonance in its unique voice as mentor rather than hero, and its differentiator in its gift. But that's the easy part. In the transparent world of the digital era, mythic success will take something more, a commitment to live the higher values you espouse. Those that don't will lose credibility and their stories with it. Brands brave enough to live their values will reach iconic status and light up the digital landscape. They will tell the stories and create the myths that will win the story wars.
Michael can help us uh, we'll turn it around this time, but let's just do a video call. <coughs> I'm just, this is obviously me talking to you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the class. I've been looking forward to seeing you. Are you still there? Can you see them? Yeah, I can see their ceiling. <laughs> hey, there they are, right? Hey. <laughs> so you're actually on a big screen. Um, can we make that bigger when we turn down the lights? Okay, now you have a giant head. <laughs> that's, kind of our that's great. Um, hi, we're going to be asking you some questions that we had. Um, so, my name's Richika, and I'm Stephen. Oh, why don't you go? They can't. They can only see you. Yeah. No, no, no. So, Richika, get your face in there. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> can you? Yeah, there. Hi. Um, so the first question was what inspired you and um, the movement behind the power of storytelling, the video we just uh, saw as a class right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in 1999, I was starting to explore how the internet and all these digital tools, which I was feeling was putting the um, means of distribution into everybody's hands. I wanted to know how that would change the way people communicate. And so I, I had this idea that if people could distribute whatever ideas they had, they'd start to want to distribute messages of passion more than just basic brand messages. Instead of telling their friends, hey, buy these speakers, they would want to tell their friends, this is what I really care about. And so value-based messages, I felt like, were going to get this new platform. And that's what I wanted to explore how to do. So we put out a few different um, approaches to it over the next five years. And once in a while, we put out something that would go wildly viral, would go crazy. So we made this movie, a spoof of The Matrix, called The Matrix, And it got like 25 million views before YouTube ever came along. And we kind of copied that success and then made a, a, a movie about organic food called Grocery Store Wars. And a bus with Star Wars, and that went massively viral. And I started to wonder like, why certain things would get 30 million people to come to them and other things wouldn't. And in looking through that lens, and also in my admiration for the movies The Matrix and Star Wars, I started looking for patterns. And that's when I got introduced to kind of like hit over the head with Campbell's Hero's Journey, which is the basis for Star Wars and The Matrix. And also just starting to research why human beings respond to certain communications. And I found out that storytelling has always been the way that we humans communicate. So it went from a passion for going viral into a deep passion for ancient mythology, storytelling, and growth journey. Great. John, I have a question for you. Um, uh, in, you. You do this with the, uh, the story of stuff really well. Uh, but the question is, how do you conceptualize creating a story around a complex problem while keeping the audience connected and inspired when people are so used to short snippets and you're dealing with the story of stuff, for example, which is this really complex issue? Yeah. So there are a few, there are a few things. The rule of thumb that I always use is um, simplify without dumbing down. Main steps. How do you bring something that is abstract and fact-based and um, usually unseeable and untouchable, how do you bring it down to human scale? That's what storytelling is all about. Instead of talking about parts per million of CO2, you talk about what it means in somebody's life. Instead of talking about systems and like abstract words like uh, systems or capitalism, you talk about what it's like in the, in the grocery store or at the Best Buy. Um, so bring down to the level of individual experience, People relate, obviously, to characters and other people's experience. So I bring forth either real characters or archetypal characters to get people to, to pay attention. Um, how do you bring everything, again, back to that human scale? It's one thing that's so important. And with Audience of Hero, as you saw in the video, that doesn't mean being manipulative and essentially simplifying the issue to the point where we don't trust that our audiences are actually 
capable of understanding complex things. We just respect our audiences by using humor, using scale, and things they can feel in touch. The other thing about the internet, which I think is a really big mistake and assumption, is that people only want content in two or three minute chunks. Um, we think we want that, but like with any great innovation, we don't really know what we want until we get it and we love it. And so what really you have to pay attention to is that there's two ways of being on the internet. One is the browsing and one is the viewing um, kind of stance, body posture, and mental framework. The browsing is all about, I'm clicking between five windows, I'm looking for things that I want to see what happens. The, the viewing is really what happens when someone says, wait a minute, this is more like a television experience, this is more like a theatrical experience, I'm going to sit back and actually give this some time. And if you can capture someone in the first 20 seconds with a compelling story, you can actually see the body posture change if they're watching it. Instead of having their hands on their teeth, they actually sit back. And if you can keep earning their attention every 20 seconds, you're going to see them hook. The Coney 2012 video, which went so viral last year, um, <coughs> 30 minutes long, and we've got 70 million viewers in the first week, simply because it got people to sit back and take it in. So I think we still are really interested in, in not just short form media, we have to buy our audience attention. You can't do that so little about the television wants a lot of us to do. Great. Do you guys hear properly? Yeah. 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 that's one of the best ways to really connect and engage people um, when they're in this viewing state online? Um, yeah, there's, there's two um, pieces to that. If you look at Hollywood, if you look at uh, television, you'll see that um, a lot of the stories that we tell are the same stories that we always told, and they're kind of just recycled versions. So certainly one of the simplest things that we can do is go back and look at existing myths and try to update them for our time tell the same stories again and again. Um, and that's, you know, as I mentioned, like my experience spoofing the, the Matrix or spoofing Star Wars. That is a very powerful thing to do. But when I talk about myth, I'm also talking about the possibility of building grand communications that build myth. And um, in, in the book, I talk about what a myth really is. And, and if we think about that, we can start writing our own new myth. So a myth is a, is a cultural story that really matters. It's the kind of story that people don't just want to hear and be entertained by but they build their identity around and they build actions around. We know for brands, it's so important to identify with your brand and act on it, then that's what you're really looking for. So myths have always built societies by combining four key elements. Uh, explanation, so here's a clear sense of, of how the world works in a way that makes sense to you but also expands your knowledge. Um, meaning, it tells you where you fit into that explanation, gives you a sense of place and self, it helps you build identity. Uh, story. It takes place not here now, but all the way long ago. It's full of symbolic meaning and, and kind of delightful world. And ritual. And fourth is ritual, which is something you can do to live that story out. If you can think about your marketing campaign in ways that teach people a new way to understand the world, a sense of what believing that story means in their own life and where they have like, this sense of identity, um, uh, if you can do it with symbolic storytelling and delight rather than cold fact, and if you can give them a simple way to live that out, you can actually create these iconic brands. The, the example that I use in the old days, which everyone can relate to, is the Marlboro brand. Um, how classic inadequacy marketing did just that. So like in the 50s, when most campaigns, were, you know, let's say the 40s, most campaigns were fact-based, they talked about features, they talked about why a product was great. So then they decided with the Marlboro Man to really use storytelling to build a new myth, right? So instead of talking about this new cigarette, built in cigarette for, for men, um, and what about why it tasted better, why it was healthier, which normal cigarettes were doing at the time, they came along and said, okay, here's a new explanation of the way the world works. This is the first filtered cigarette for men ever. So men can smoke filtered cigarettes now. Um, it gave you meaning. It said, it didn't say about the cigarette, it just said if you smoke it, you will be a rugged cowboy. Um, it gave you a story. Nobody thought the Marlboro Man was real. There were no claims in those photographs. They were just a story about a person. And then ritual, it was a clear way to live that story out. And so that kind of storytelling built, you know, the consumer brands of the 20th century. And now as we go to build, uh, you know, social media brands, we can use those same techniques, but hopefully for, for better ends. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about telling values-based stories. 
Do you mm -hmm. think there's any brands right now that are doing that really well? Or also, how do you see kind of advertising changing now that this whole new idea of um, consumers being more aware of what they're buying in like this consumer curated world in the digital era? How do you see mm -hmm. advertising changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there are, I, I did a kind of, I did a, a, a survey when writing the book about um, brands and whether they were speaking to um, lower values, basically the inadequacy values of the past, so like whether they were speaking to people's need for safety, comfort, fitting in, um, security, which were was the old assumptions of the past, or whether they were speaking to people's higher values. And what I found was that for the most part in the broadcast era, almost all brands were speaking to lower values. This, this is the time of inadequacy marketing. Buy this product or you're not going to be safe, you're not going to be accepted. But the ones that were speaking to higher values were actually the ones, there was a tiny segment of them, but they were the ones that were the most grateful, that we most admired. So if you look at, um, for instance, like the famous ones like Apple, they weren't saying this tool will make your life easier, we'll do it for you, which is classic advertising. It was said, no, this is a tool for your own self-expression. This is about you being the hero and expressing yourself in a rebellious way. Or a Nike, which doesn't say this shoe will make athletic achievement easy. It says athletic achievement's really hard, and actually you're going to fail, but you have to work harder in the Just Do It campaign. Or Obama in 2008, who came along and said, I won't fix this country for you. You have to do it for yourself. People respond to that higher level, um, even in the broadcast era, that higher level values-based um, calls to action. I think that now, there's so much more transparency, there's so much more ability to engage with brands that actually what you need to do is be very much even more explicit about your values and speaking to higher level values and then ask people to contribute their own stories. I think Patagonia, for instance, is a really, a really good example of a brand that when I talk to them even about their marketing for the book, they said, we don't do marketing, we simply talk about our values. That's all we think about is talking about our values. And they talk about doing, you know, enjoying, enjoying life while doing the least harm. Every story that they tell is about their journey to do it. They even talk about how they're failing a lot. Um, and then they ask their audience members, they create a platform by which their audience members can contribute their own experiences on the same journey. So I think they're really successful and that's really powerful. Um, you know, I think we all know how something like Tom's Shoes got people to feel like they're participating in a movement by buying shoes and, and living out their values. Um, in the book, I also, you know, use this example of, of BP and the opposite problem of it. So how, you know, when British Petroleum became beyond petroleum, um, how they kind of fooled everyone with this green brand, even though they were being the most aggressive oil exploration company, even fooling themselves. And ultimately, by not being able to live out those values, the value of that brand fell apart. So um, I do think that we live in a far more uh, transparent time. If you can be clear about what your values are, and if you can help your audience live those values out, make them higher level values, not only do you get more affinity, but you can find, as you learn to more deeply incorporate them into your business, you can tell stories about that journey, which creates more helpful content. Um, this kind of leads to the next question, um, which was um, basically we talk a lot in this program about transmedia storytelling as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I was looking at some of your um, stuff, like the Glo Global Zero campaign and shareable.net. If you could talk a little bit about that and. Um, if that is kind of along the lines of higher higher level values and storytelling in a way where you're kind of pushing people audiences to engage and whether engagement yeah. is part of part of what you need to do in the digital era. Yeah, um, let's see. There's a couple of things to say about that. Um, <clears throat> I think that on the on the point of transmedia storytelling, I think that right now. When I, when I start, first started writing the book, when I was supposed to write the book, there was this question of, can you teach people how to go viral? And um, I started thinking about what all the techniques are for that. But really what I realized is that even that way of thinking is a very old-moded way of thinking. How do we make a giant media splash is an old-moded way of thinking in which, um, in which advertisers and marketers could invest a lot in one 30-second spot or two 30-second spots a year in that campaign. They blast it out. They hope people respond to it. It's over. Um, so when I actually thought about what's really happening now, brands are becoming more platforms. And they need to not be telling better stories only. They need to actually be thinking of themselves as an unfolding story, again, with audience as the hero of that story. They need to think about how every touch point 
is an opportunity for that story to unfold further. And so the video you guys saw allows you to put on one page, you know, what is that moral we stand for? What are our values? What is our archetype that allows us to figure out what our unique voice is? How do we, what is that gift we're giving our heroes? But then you need to play that out throughout the world, basically, and allow, in some way, the best brands to make the entire world a stage for their story to unfold. So with something like Global Zero, um, what we were actually doing was creating, envisioning a movement that doesn't quite yet exist, showing what it looks like in action, showing what that future is, um, and then hoping all the people either implied or mentioned in that video will actually start taking those actions through all of these offline organizing tools, online organizing tools. Um, the idea was to get the video into the White House, which we did. The idea is to get a lot of people to understand what taking action means. And so now young people are starting to contribute their story to, to, to match that story. So yeah, we think a lot, about, a lot about our campaigns very much as sort of declarations of stories. The, open, the opening salvo is a story that's supposed to unfold over time um, through all kinds of media. And that's you know, something that we're all still exploring, but I think that's the holy grail, is that over time the story continues to unfold over Facebook, over Twitter, in video form, uh, in, in real life experience. That's the goal, yeah. So we were uh, reviewing some of the videos, and we're really curious to get your comments on what you think about, I guess, narration techniques. For example, uh, with the story of stuff, you have a format where you have someone narrating, and then you have the animated um, uh, video, if you will, showing people the different, the different, uh, mm -hmm. the different pieces of the puzzle. In the, in the Matrix, something similar is done only in the Matrix, you have characters doing the narrating as opposed to sort of the lady walking you through. Basically, yeah. basically two questions. When you're narrating a story versus someone in the story talking to you about it, say a personal experience, what are the pros and cons of, of having a, a third, party, third party narrator? Mm -hmm. And then also, do you have any thoughts on the fact that even though it's very popular right now, animation if you're telling the story of uh, industrial food production and, and animal slaughter, is there something useful to using animation instead of live film footage of you know, animals being taken to market? What are, yeah. you, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, um, yeah, two very separate questions. Let me answer them totally separate. Uh, the first is um, about narrators. It's, you know, I kind of regret in some ways having made the story of stuff in, small, in one small way, which is that people look at that project and they're like, oh, wow, you can just go up and say a bunch of stuff and people will have to listen. And then everybody wants, believes that they can just say their thing and everyone will listen. Everyone calls us and says, can you make the story of this and the story of that? Um, there's something magical about when that really works, when you have just a narrator giving the facts and you add a video track to it and suddenly it comes to life. And in that case, at the time that story of stuff came out, it really, it really worked. It's much more efficient because you don't have to create all these grand metaphors. You don't have to do any exposition. You don't have to set up all these contrived scenes that, um, to get your point across. You just say what you need to say and bring it to life through animation. Um, but what it required that I don't think is easy to capture is that, you know, Amy Leonard, the, the um, narrator of story of stuff is, <clears throat> someone who literally has spent a decade dealing with this. She's one of the most intelligent and passionate and also quite, like um, amazing performers that I know. So it's very hard. You need a great narrator who has hits that tone, and she happened to do it. She was the right spokesperson for that message, and it was her message, not ours. You know, We helped her craft it, but um, it, was, it was amazing authenticity coming through. So if you can pull that off, yeah, it's more efficient. It's great, but you get someone up there droning away, and then you try to add awesome animation to it, it's not going to work. Um, so you know, the other direction you can go is try to contrive a whole set of scenes to, um, to, to, tell, to, to get an idea across, which is how storytelling has really always worked. It's like you create a world, and then you try to play out a lesson in that world. Um, it's a lot harder um, to do. It takes a lot more, you know, it's a lot less uh, ideas per minute, because you have to actually have the drama play out. Um, but it's a lot more fun in a lot of ways too, to, to develop those stories in that way. It's just a special skill. Um, now the question of like why animation and if that's a better way of getting ideas across. The idea with the Matrix was really that we felt that it was an idea, you know, we did that one completely on our own and um, we, were, we set ourselves for a, challenge, uh, for a challenge. We thought it was something people really cared about. We thought that the big block was that no one wants to see 
disgusting images if they don't have to. Like, I'm going to send you an email. If you're going to open that email and it's gross and it's about your food, you know, I'm not going to build any social capital by doing that, so it's not going to go anywhere. And the people who already were seeing that were the people who were motivated, and there was no way to go beyond that choir of people. So what we had to do was put some emotional and um, conceptual distance between what we were actually talking about and what we um, wanted, what we wanted to show. Our goal was that we wanted seven-year-olds to love it and watch it and ha have their parents enjoy it and be glad their kid was watching it, and that's the goal we started out with. So that way, when you bring this, and you're not trying to shock your audience, and you're not trying to gross them out, and you're not trying to force them into action, but really offering them something delightful and fun and hilarious, and then subtly giving them a new way of thinking, that's a far more powerful thing. So almost in some ways, the worst, no one has to watch your really negative, nasty thing anymore if, you don't, if they don't want to. So how do you make it delightful and appealing, even when talking about some of the darkest issues in the climate? And I, I think Demetrius really did change the way people communicate around the key, key food issue because it was delightful and that was the, the goal there. And that animation gives you that opportunity. So our program, I'm sure as you know, is designed for social innovation and I think a lot of us are going to be starting our own businesses and trying to reach either these niche audiences or gain mass appeal for <coughs> whatever our venture may be. And I'm wondering like, if you could give us one thing that you think would really help uh, either from storytelling or something that we could learn from advertising um, that would make our ventures successful. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of things. <laughs> one thing is, okay, so one thing, one thing that came up when you asked that question is um, this idea of like whether you're going for mass appeal or sort of niche audiences, <laughs> The, the, like our world is now a collection of niche audiences, essentially, and we actually, we, as we've always been, but in some ways we've been able to further sort ourselves, and we marketers and business people can start to see those, those sortings, because we actually have this two-way communication. And what I've learned time and again with my clients is that there's a desire to go beyond the usual choir of, of people that you reach and reach the broad public. And how do we stop, you know, they come to us because they want to stop talking to the same old folks and talk to something new. What I, the main piece of advice I would start with is saying, look, I know you don't want to preach to the choir anymore, but the choir are the people who are ready and primed to take your product or your idea out to the world. They just don't have any reason to do it um, or have the right vehicle. So if you can give them something that so taps into and, and validates who they are and helps them build social capital by passing it along, um, that's where you can start reaching the general public by arming and respecting your choir. So I think that the more that it's so easy to sort of take them for granted, that inner circle, but the more that we can think of how do I help the people that I have access to and who naturally will love my product build social capital by sharing it with others, how do I make them the sort of hero of this launch? Um, that's where we start seeing ripple effects. With Annie Leonard, you know, she had 10,000 people on her email list, and that's all she had, and she worked really closely with those people to make sure the message was the message that they wanted to hear, but she could package better than anyone else. And that's how that went from, you know, 10 to 35, 10,000 to 35 million, because she respected that inner choir. So I would just say, you know, it's all about empathy, it's all about understanding your audience, and it's all about respecting those people who are right there with you right now and giving them something they can use first before trying to reach the wider public. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. On that note, like the work that you've done with Free Range, and I remember <clears throat> I read an interview um, where someone asked you, um, "What's the one thing that you hope is not true?" And it was that um, people that are making campaigns or uh, basically doing what Free Range does can't sustain themselves. Um, uh -huh. So what would you say is necessary to sustain yourselves? And like, how do you guys do it? Because you guys have been around for a while. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, you know, it's, we don't work with the sort of, you know, multi-million dollar budgets that I guess like a Coca-Cola can bring to the table. And if once you're in that world, um, it's hard to get out of it because everything looks so difficult otherwise. But you know, we've been able to build a self-sustaining business. I think partly because there's so many, um, so many social ventures are basically coming online now that really either, um, you know, kind of combine social mission with, um, with 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 a profit motive, or um, we're seeing nonprofits that are learning to thrive by bringing forth. Um, 
and bringing forth offerings that, that can help sustain them. So we've actually seen, even you know, through bad economy and all the time that we've been here, we've actually seen a good base of people who actually do have budgets and can afford to go out and communicate and, but they're looking for disruptive ways to do it. They don't have the money necessarily to go on the, the, the main route. So they, they're looking for a disruptive partner, and they're seeing, like, okay, we can do this one big attempt to put ourselves out there, and we want someone who can show us huge returns, and because we've had that opportunity to get big returns for some small investments, they come to us often. Now, we don't always succeed. Part of the problem with disruptive technology, disruptive ideas, is the world's not always ready for them, or they're all always experimental. So unlike a, um, a company that'll ask you to give you $50 million to an ad agency and then do a global ad buy and you can get expectable results, our results are often unexpected and not always what we want. Um, but I do think that, the, that audiences and the public are so looking for values-based communication these days. There's so much distrust of broadcast media, just so much distrust of business, um, and so much opportunity for people to connect on a value basis that uh, I don't think, I think the differentiation you get by talking about your values and living your values is actually not a hindrance to your growth, but it's actually the main driver of your growth. So I often think that if we hadn't, if we were less picky about the jobs that we took on and spent more of our time being broadly appealing to corporations without, uh, without mission, you probably wouldn't be around today. It wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be a bonus for us. It would actually be um, have undermined our brand enough that we wouldn't have differentiation. So, I guess uh, you know it's not as easy in this world, but also it's our it's our competitive advantage. So it pays us back. Great. Thanks, Jonah. That's a good segue into my question, which is that um, the television show Mad Men really dramatizes the, the evil side of marketing and the, and the history of marketing. Uh, what do you think that there are things that, moving forward, when we're talking about the kind of social change marketing that we're interested in, things that we can learn or harness from Madison Avenue to our own benefit, that things that have obviously been successful for them, even though the outcomes weren't always great? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, one of the things that marketing is one of the most reviled and disgusted, you know, disgusting kind of uh, professions out there. Consistently people hate it. And you know, Mad Men is really a reflection of like, our our attraction and repulsion to the entire industry. And I myself, you know, in sitting down to write a marketing book, as someone who really considers myself a social activist, I kind of was surprised to be writing a marketing book at this point in my life. Um, although I, I believe that marketing really, you know, marketers, as I, as I write in the book, marketers really have become the myth makers and storytellers of our day. We can see so much more um, advanced storytelling from marketers than we do anywhere else, and we get 3,500 messages a day. So really just seeding the, um, seeding the practice of marketing to just saying that's, that's slimy bad business is actually giving up the opportunity to create the myths and stories that will create our future. So I think it's absolutely necessary to get involved in the game for people who are, you know, to, to not be repulsed by it, but to actually learn its techniques. What Madison Avenue has been able to do um, that I think is hard for social marketers to really grasp because they're coming from such a different place. What would generally happen in, you know, if we see in Madison, but really if you read about the rise of the great consumer brands, is they're coming um, to, they, they very early on get involved with an advertising agency to create, um, it, it's, it's all about the image. They're not actually finding a product that the world needs and then telling an advertising agency, how do we let people know about this? They're actually, a lot of, you know, like, we, there's a hole in the market where you can create a new kind of snack chip. The marketing itself is about the development of the product. It exists for marketing reasons. And they go and they, the, the, the brief that goes to the advertising agency on Madison Avenue in, in, in the traditional model is we have nothing to say. Say something fantastic that gets people interested and then gets people buying. And so unfettered by any sort of facts or unfettered by anything important to say, Madison Avenue is really good at just making some really funny stuff or making some really interesting stuff. They don't get bogged down as our nonprofit or social venture clients often do in like the passion for the issue that and the complexity. There is no complexity there. So I think what we really need to be able to let go of as a, you know, us social change people tend to be a little bit more intellectual, a little bit more steeped in, in history and fact and all this stuff. And we think the facts will speak for themselves. I think we need to recognize that, that 
uh, we need to step back from our own complexity, recognize that nobody really wants our complexity on first blush, and figure out how can we take that attitude of what is the moment of delight we can bring for people? What is that dis most distilled thing? And that's harder when you have a more complex issue. But if you can't distill, which a lot of our clients you know, really resist doing in our early work with them, no one will ever understand you. So I think that we just expect our facts will speak for themselves when they won't, and we can take a, a page from Madison Avenue, not being deceptive, but in speaking to the things that really matter to people rather than what matters to ourselves. Wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> um, do you have any um, other things you'd like to say to us as, like, as we venture out as social innovators in this space? Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, does anyone else have questions? Yeah, yeah if you have any other questions, I'll free from say things if you'd rather. Well, why don't you ask him to tell the story of himself? I'm, I'm just very curious <laughs> to how, you know, the story of Jonah. Um, how, how did you come to be who you are doing what you do? Um, and delight us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. How did I come to be who I am? Um, I, uh, I grew up in Woodstock, New York, and um, not far from you guys, and uh, had a always a deep sense of, um, of just kind of need to, to contribute in the world in some sense of, of justice or environmentalism, and I you know, came, from a, came from a town that was all about kind of counterculture. Um, but I also came from a place that was incredibly boring. Um, you know, we didn't have any media where I was growing up. We didn't have any TV stations, and we didn't. Um, it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and no access to almost anything. And so um, we spent a lot of time in that state of, of boredom and need for for more stimulation that we did not get when I would see my friends. And one of my friends, uh, Louis Fox who would ultimately become the co-founder of my company, had a, a movie camera. And basically what we would always default to when we had nothing to do was to create movies. When sometime we were seven years old, we would start telling stories. And um, often those stories were something about whether it was, uh, I remember we did a story about the, uh, nuclear weapons and Reagan trying to blow up the world, um, or stories about somebody trying to destroy the forest in the backyard. Uh, we always had this sense that like, creating entertainment around issues was what was, was drawing us and what we were passionate about. Um, and so when I went to college and became a, a journalist and started thinking about how people, how you can reach people with broad information and build community around ideas, um, I thought I was really moving away from that creative side and into the side of thinking through, um, thinking through facts and thinking about how you just tell people what they need to know and they'll listen. Um, and it wasn't until I discovered design and how much the, the, the newspaper I was working on it was, was being judged and influenced by how it looked and how it was presented rather than what it said did I start to see sort of that old creative, um, that old creative spark coming back and recognizing how the way that you package ideas is really as important or maybe more important than the ideas themselves. And so I was playing with those things when I moved down to DC and um, I called Lewis up and I said, you know, we've got to get together and do something here. The internet's coming online. People are starting to share their ideas. All those crazy things that we did, we can start publishing now. Let's get together. And it was funny because we brought some of these assumptions that I think everybody brings to business when we were 23 years old. Like you can't make money um, doing what you believe in. And you can't make money unless you're working with major corporations. And so some of our first ideas were um, things that actually you know, are sort of transmedia ideas now, but like uh, treasure hunts across the internet, where you'd go to you know corporate sites and find clues, and you put those clues together, and then go to a real place, and you'd find real money. And we got started building business models for like interesting internet startups in 1999. And um, and then we looked at each other one day, and I remember just this flash of inspiration as we were looking at a, someone, we, someone had thrown a beautiful looking brochure for students for free Tibet on our, on our table while we were working. And we looked at each other and we said, like, why would we be sending people to a Burger King website when we wouldn't go to Burger King ourselves? And um, we scrapped about, like, right at that moment basically, we scrapped about three months of hard work, and we said, um, let's really follow let's bring all of our passions together. We have nothing to lose. Um, we had no family and no uh, debt, no mortgage, and let's just, let's just bring all our passions together and try a grand experiment, which is to see if messages of passion around 
create, you know, creatively packaged, can move around the internet and get people to notice. And um, I have felt that going down that exploration of the things that I care most about, um, and even writing a book that was you know, supposed to be a book about viral video and turned into a book about uh, the new mythology of our world and our future, um, and being authentic to myself is what makes me successful and what made our business successful. And then every opportunity to go away from that, that we resisted just further makes me believe that that's the way to success. So, um, you know, my story has really been one about just moving closer and closer to the passions of my child and the inner being, I guess, and um, finding the rewards of, of other people who are moving the same way and also seeing the world moving in that direction too. I think social responsible creativity and business was not as hot in 1999 as it is today, and nearly so. So it's been satisfying to see the world um, moving towards us as we move towards it. So that's my basic story. Thank you. A, a question I would have is, um, you're, you're so into it, it, it seems as though, oh no. Are you still there? Yeah, yes. he's here. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it seems, you make so many keen observations about how people consume information and even the posture they have, the events in front of a screen. Um, did you do any research, or is this social observation uh, through a journalist's uh, inquiring mind? H how did you come to your how about research? If I did research, you mean like in writing the book overall, or in that particular? No, no. In, in your profession, I mean, in advertising, people, um, you know, have these groups of people behind a one-way mirror, and uh, right. watch them do this and that, or have volunteer college students. Uh, do uh, various things in front of a computer while their eyes are being tracked, that kind of thing. Do, do you use yeah. data to drive your work, or is it uh, more your uh, gut? Um, no, you know, I use other people's data to drive my work. So I, don't, <laughs> I haven't had the, uh, the opportunity or the resources to like run major experiments. Um, but like, you know, I'm a synthesizer, like so many authors are today, of you know, scientists' work that kind of sits on shelves and that amazingly, you know, obviously you can find the touch of a button if you know what we're looking for. So I try to back up everything that I that I say and do with some grounding, but um, you know, I'm not doing social like social psychology or psychological research on people myself. Um, although I, I have been told by my publisher that if you want to sell a million books, that you need to do, you actually need to do a bunch of uh, you know new research that no one's seen before. So maybe one day. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I'd be interested. Hi. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about your uh, the way that you determine a project that you're interested in taking on or rejecting. If the, how you think about your values and the alignment between what you do and what you want to put out in the world and and the people who are coming to you with various questions or seeking your services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the most satisfying projects are the things, obviously, that don't just align with our values, but really have an opportunity to to be seen by a broad, you know, to shift culture. And um, so the things that we're most keen on are things that, yes, are value aligned, but also that seem rele relevant to the zeitgeist of the moment. And, you know, we spend a good amount of time really looking out at the world and seeing where conversations are and trying to let, you know, potential partners know um, what stories we're interested in telling right now. And we're actually even doing some explorations now with some foundations about getting direct funding to tell stories even if we don't have clients who want to tell them. But I think so what we're really looking for is where we see opportunity to make sort of massive cultural mind shift. And that's you know hard to really figure out where that is, but we're looking for stories that are relevant to the moment because um, we see what the return is, uh, both socially and financially, when we hit something that, that is resonant. Um, but you know, we do spend a lot of time working with clients who have you know, solid and strong missions, but are not yet relevant in the zeitgeist because they haven't figured out their message. And so I really enjoy working with clients who, who have a, a seed of inspiration, um, but really need to learn how to focus it. And we can help do sort of like organizational psychology therapy on our clients as what well, you know, transform the way they see themselves, even while we create creative media. That's an exciting opportunity for us as well. Um, you know. The, in writing the book and kind of publishing my ideas for the broadest audience and doing it with Harvard Business, I think that uh, one of my struggles was 
I don't want to, and I've never wanted to serve um, clients or audiences that I don't feel values aligned with. And obviously, putting out a book is to give it to everybody. So um, on the one hand, I think we're we're now speaking to everybody, regardless of whether they're a you know weapons manufacturer, oil company, or an environmental nonprofit. So our ideas are being published for for everyone to see. And my thinking with that is that. On the level of teaching people storytelling, I'm kind of willing to like let anybody know. Obviously, I've published the book, what I think, but my goal is to get people to understand that you can't tell great stories unless you have clear core values, and those values need to be in line with the values of humanity, and that's where great storytelling comes from. So I'm hoping for um, this public stuff that I'm doing to help shift individual marketers to, to see to see that their their companies need to be more values based if they want to be heard in this new era. Um, <clears throat> What we don't do, and which is easy to kind of sniff out, is you know we don't we don't partner with people who are don't have anything mission based to say at all. So even if it's kind of neutral, but it's nothing to do with our mission um, values. We don't we don't work with them, and we especially try to avoid working with companies that um, are putting forth a positive social message but really don't deserve to stand behind it. So we don't want to like allow a company who is environmentally destructive to put forth a nice message about the environment that's thus implying that they are doing the right thing. And so we turn down a lot of corporate opportunities um, and say yes to corporate opportunities where there's a real social mission baked in. Like we work with Autodesk on their sustainability stuff, and that's exciting, and they are truly committed to it, so we're committed to them. But we uh, turned down Coca-Cola when they asked us to uh, make a movie about how obesity is a problem, but soda doesn't cause it. So yeah, a lot of, <laughs> of inspiration. Yay. <laughs> how did you do that video, then? I don't know. It never came out, so hopefully they got discouraged. The there is this video about Coke. Did you guys see it? Yeah. The polar bears? The polar bears. Well, that was against Coke. Yeah. 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 All right. But yeah, Coke did something. I, I was very interested that in your video you had um, uh, the, the, the one that we were just watching, the clip, had Oppenheimer comparing himself to Arjuna. And mm -hmm. uh, the fact that he had read the Bhagavad Gita, but clearly he had not been raised as Hindu. And, uh, and so much, I mean, our class represents 11 countries. Um, so much of the projects people propose to do are, are international. Last week, we were all at the Bhutanese consulate, where we talked about the concept of of, of gross national happiness. Are you familiar with that? The, and it just turned out that someone on the board of the, the GAO was there saying that in Washington they've been trying to discuss how to measure happiness for over a decade and they, you know, just fight about it. They can't come up with an answer. Yeah, yeah. I said that brings happiness in Washington. <laughs> but um, the, I guess my question to you is, are, do you feel these values are international? Have you worked internationally? And how would you um, advise the Bhutanese government in expanding um, the uh, adoption of uh, happiness measures um, for nations? Yeah, you know, I've been, uh, I've always been a fan of um, kind of universal human experience. I think it's probably because of uh, you know seeing how this sort of bi to me success success with iconic storytelling is kind of binary either no one hears hears about it or everybody hears about it. like we have a when when things work and like then I have a lot of failures under my belt but the successes that I've had um, it's amazing to see them traveling to getting you know to seeing that people in Kazakhstan are interested in story of stuff or that you know one of the Israel was one of the most popular places to watch the Matrix like. It doesn't really matter. We're not trying to target an audience based on some phony demographic insight. We're really trying to speak to universal human experience. And that's why Joseph Campbell is so interesting to me, because he really tried to find those common themes, or why Carl Jung, in his psychological research and, and use of archetypes, we use a lot of archetype work, said that you know there are primordial images in every human being um, that are part of you know collective subconsciously in our entire world. Um, so I actually believe that with a lot of cross-pollinization of culture now, um, and that things that are, you know, speak to the deepest human senses are pretty universal. Um, in the book, I write a lot about how Freud said that there are universal human values, but their only universal values are fear, greed, status seeking, etc. Um, but Maslow said there are also universal human values 
that go beyond that, that everybody is seeking community justice, truth, um, participation. So I, I, I kind of, as much as I'm sure a lot of ad planners would cringe at this, I kind of like going for the, um, the universal rather than the ultra-specific. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't package it with, with what I call familiars, things that make it seem relevant to specific audiences. But I think speaking to people as human beings is better than speaking them as ethnicities or nationalities. Um, you know, with Bhutan, uh, I, I, you know, I talked, I, I think that this is a big theme for Annie Leonard, and I, you know, continue to make movies with her, we talk about this a lot. Um, I think that, you know, since the global economic crisis, there has been a lot more conversation about the things that matter, more of the things that matter in life, and more of a rejection of, of growth as an ultimate good. Um, so I think that in terms of zeitgeist, people are ready for it, and they're excited to hear it, and it's an exciting kind of meme, the gross national happiness thing. Uh, how I would, I, I don't think in the next three minutes I can tell you exactly how I would <laughs> you know, help Bhutan um, get it out to the world, but I guess I would, again, say, this is one of those perfect places for storytelling. Gross national happiness is a metric and a number, which is great, but how do you make that human? How do you get your average person to see what that would mean in their life? How can you envision what the world would be like if that's what we're measuring? You know, and of course, you know, what, get me what gets measured gets managed. So like, what if we were really managing happiness over economic growth? What would that world look like? And if you can paint a compelling picture of that, then you know, people might want to move towards it. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of failures under your belt. What's the best failure you've had in terms of what of, of le having learning the biggest lesson? Um, let's see, man. Uh, <laughs> failures are disappointing, so I try to I try to learn from them, but I also put them out of my mind after a while. So um, the biggest failures I've had um, I definitely. Think it's best. <laughs> I've had a, I've, I've had a lot of. The best thing I've had, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've fallen sick. You've been whining about my biggest feathers. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that we did a, a project for, um, we, did, we did a project about seafood that was, you know, kind of universally scoffed at and forgotten almost immediately that we thought was really funny. Um, the idea was about, you know, about a Marine Stewardship Council seafood that was ethically sourced, and um, and we went super just for humor. We made like a puppet, like the Pets.com puppet, and took took this fish puppet, it was called Stinky Fish, out onto the wharf in San Francisco and interviewed people. And essentially, the whole goal was to gross people out about how disgusting seafood that you know that is not that's kind of mass produced is. Um, this is at the time we were getting a lot of food work after the Matrix, and it was probably funnier than other work that we had done in a lot of ways. And it was, um, but but it was really nasty kind of, and it was it was kind of gross out, and it was negative, and it made people feel guilty. And um, you know that was a great lesson to see that the audiences not only just didn't really vibe with it, but they also um, really expected something more from us and from our clients than to make them feel bad about themselves, which is classic inadequacy marketing. And it, it reinforced my understanding that it's not just how many great jokes that you can make, but how much can you give something that that, that buoys people's um, sense of self and gives them positive alternatives rather than make them feel shitty about themselves. So that's, a, that's an example of something I, you know, I wish I didn't have to have gone through to be embarrassed by, but learned a lot from. Well, thank you. Thank you for spending an hour with us. I don't know if there are any more final Just questions. One quick, um, one quick question. I mean, basically about the storytelling and like universal stories that you were talking about, as well as the video um, we saw. Do you think it's really important to to kind of always use archetypes like in, that we find in myths? Um, like for example, like they say in India, um, the typical Bollywood film is based off of the Ramayana and television series are usually based off of the Mahabharata, um, uh -huh. you know, in terms of like the social structure. And, and then they obviously modernize it and there's all these characters and stuff. But do you think that's like an important format to consider? Yeah, I think, I think um, the archetypes 
for sure. You know, my, my first, obviously I'm influenced by Star Wars, and my, my earliest experience with the character, fictional characters was collecting Star Wars figures. And you know, later coming to see how those were perfect archetypes, you know, the perfect villain, the perfect animal sidekick, the perfect rebel, the perfect innocent, you know, these are all Jungian archetypes that were simply mapped to cool characters that even a five-year-old can get excited and just fall in love, where like a movie like Avatar, which sold more tickets than Star Wars, everyone's just a blue guy. You know, it's like, who's going to collect Avatar figures? Um, you can't even remember their names, right? So I think that you can't be stuck constantly just telling the stories of the past, but recognizing how people respond to villainy, how people respond to heroicism, um, and what works, because you know, our brains haven't changed physically over the last 70,000 years. Um, so you know, what works is what always works. And so, how do you update and expand from there? But yeah, if you ignore that and just sit on your own, like I'm making up my own characters, um, I think you're missing an opportunity to, to to build off the familiar, which is you know what we're looking for. Thank you. Okay, so that was awesome. Yeah. 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 Congratulations on your book. Of course, we're all buying it, and uh, so that that big bump in sales in New York City, and uh, you'll understand where it comes from. So thank you again for your time and uh, generosity. Sure, and uh, if you'd like a book, let me know, and love to hear your thoughts. All right, great. Twitter or something we can follow you at. Do you do you have a Twitter account or did you? Adam uh, Sachs on Twitter or Jonah at FreeRange.com. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.